multiculturalism. Uh, we use this so loosely that we don't even know what it means anymore. Well, Douglas knew what it meant. It, it meant the dream put into reality that people of every kind of creed, every kind of race, background, ethnicity, difference, even though they're going to fight it out, they're going to fight like hell over resources and, and meaning and religion and interpretation. They're going to fight like hell. But it's possible to create a democracy in which all of them can actually live. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Uh, once again, we are here in the quarantine closet, however many weeks we are into the uh, COVID quarantine. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, reckoning with our past, reckoning with our history. Um, we've, we've seen these protesters uh, in city to city tearing down Confederate monuments, many of which, if not most of which, are actually not um, erected <laughs> in the period of the Confederacy or after the Civil War. I mean, it would be a weird thing to do right after you lost. They're, they're erected. Uh, they tend to be erected in the late 19th century into the 1920s and 30s, even sometimes in the wake of, you know, Brown v. Board of Ed as essentially contemporaneous statements of white supremacy and domination over free black citizens. And so what we've seen in these battles is that these sort of totems and statues and symbols have real political power and they are often erected as moments of political expression. And there's also been this kind of debate that they have occasioned about which figures should be on which side of, of the line. It seems very clear to me that, uh, you know, every Confederate monument in the country should be torn down. Um, but then there's a question of, you know, Christopher Columbus, question of Teddy Roosevelt or Washington and Jefferson, who, of course, are, you know, uh, founding fathers and also uh, owned slaves and partook in this, you know, irredeemable and unforgivable uh, evil system. And all of that has sort of had me thinking about, well, who who should we be building more statues to? <laughs> right. Like all this has been kind of a weirdly negative conversation about the, the statues and monuments we have. And often because those statues and monuments reflect who's in power and who's in power uh, often is a lot of people who have not great records on many of the things that we care deeply about. But one of the great lies that we are told and tell ourselves as Americans is a kind of like they didn't know better lie. It's the way that we cast back into history and say, well, you can't really criticize Christopher Columbus. You know, he didn't really realize the indigenous people uh, were, were human beings who shouldn't have their hands chopped off and shouldn't have her 14 year old girls requisitioned into sexual slavery. But the fact of the matter is there are actual contemporary critics of Christopher Columbus who say that what he's doing on the island of Hispaniola is an abomination against God. They knew then. Same thing with Andrew Jackson's Trail of Tears. Uh, it, it wasn't like Andrew Jackson didn't know he was committing ethnic cleansing. In fact, the debate on the floor of the House during the Trail of Tears was about the human rights, they didn't use that term, abomination that Andrew Jackson wanted ordered. And so was it with slavery. And so was it with the central conceit of genuine multiracial democracy. I mean, we think here in 2020, we're working towards genuine multiracial democracy, and we want a full and equal shared democratic polity across lines of gender, across lines of race and uh, religion and also sexual identity, and that that's kind of a new idea. Well, it's not a new idea. In fact, arguably the greatest American ever, top three, saw very clearly that this must be, that it was the only just and appropriate destiny for the nation to be a true multiracial democracy. And he saw it clearly 25 years before the Civil War. And he is one of the greatest American heroes we have. There should be statues to him everywhere. Um, it's not that he's unknown. His name is Frederick Douglass. You have, of course, heard of him. He's getting recognized more and more. But he is a figure of... I think a sing of, of singular towering influence and importance in the America we want to be. If you could think about a founding father for the nation, that was a founding father who truly captured intellectually and in their life the vision for a full and equitable, just American democracy. Frederick Douglass probably comes closest. <laughs> if you were to choose one, if you were to choose one to start a new Mount Rushmore, a Mount Rushmore towards multiracial, multi-ethnic, gender equitable, and that there's a complicated story there, uh, American democracy, 
you would put Frederick Douglass on that Mount Rushmore. You would erect statues to him. And all this is very fresh in my mind because I had the great pleasure of reading this uh, incredibly masterful biography. You've probably heard this book because it got a tremendous amount of attention. I believe it won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, it won a bunch of awards, so you can't keep track of them. It's called Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. It's a long study of the man's life, and it was written by David Blight, who's a Sterling Professor of American History, director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. And ever since I read the book, I've been wanting to talk to him about it. So it's my great pleasure to welcome David Blight. David, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Chris. It's a great honor. Let's talk about your way into this man who, you know, he's one of these figures where, um, you know, I think this this is sort of the case a little bit with Hamilton and, and, and Chernow's biography and then the, the musical, which is that, sure, it's not like Alexander Hamilton is not famous. He's famous. We all, you know, we know Hamilton's a founding father. Mm -hmm. But the depth of complexity of the guy's life, it's like you read it and you're like, whoa, I, Wow. And Frederick Douglass is in a somewhat similar category insofar as like, yes, we know Frederick Douglass. We, we, we know his when we see his picture, we recognize him. But the, the sheer volume of his thought, his writing, his speaking, his political influence, his life experience, I had no idea the life this man lived. Well, to go right back to your central point in your introduction, uh, he, he did have a vision of a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious America. Uh, in a more robust way than almost anybody of his own time, long before <laughs> an idea like multiculturalism was any form of consensus in this country. He was the prose poet, if you like, of American democracy in the 19th century. Uh, he was a creature of words. Uh, we can come back to that if you want, of just how a former slave, a, a kid who grows up a slave, spends 20 years as a slave, becomes such a genius with language. But he, he, he managed to find in language written prose, autobiographical prose, political editorials, thousands of speeches, even one work of fiction. He found ways to describe and explain uh, the experience of slavery as both physical and mental the experiences of racism, they didn't use that term in the 19th century, they called it racial prejudice, etc. And, and he found ways to explain what was happening to the American nation, the country itself, uh, because of this issue of slavery and its aftermath, like nobody else. Um, whether he belongs on a Mount Rushmore, I don't know. You know, on that issue, it's worth talking about as we go through this mo these monument wars, whether we've almost been too obsessed with people on monuments. Mm -hmm. And maybe we need to think more and more about memorialization, uh, about ideas and concepts mm -hmm. and events mm -hmm. and processes and so on. Uh, this obsession with heroes sometimes just gets us in trouble because, you know, everybody's got flaws. Uh, and that's why George Washington is now in trouble, right, on the monument. Right. Well, and it's also, I mean, after my encomium to Frederick Douglass, he was, of course, not not unflawed either. Um, no, he's deeply and human and not perfect. Deep, deeply human. And, and when we'll, we'll get to the, I want to get to the fight over the 14th Amendment, which to me is yeah. in some ways the most interesting, one of the most interesting moments in all of American history. Um, but first, I guess, for people that have not read the biography, which is probably the large majority of, of, of the listeners right now, mm. just tell me a little bit about how, how does Frederick Douglass become Frederick Douglass? What is the, the yeah. story of a, of, of, a, of a child born into slavery who becomes the great writer and orator? Well, he's born out in, a, in an isolated corner of the eastern shore of Maryland, 1818. Uh, if he hadn't moved to Baltimore when he was seven, eight years old and spent nine of his ten years as a slave back and forth in Baltimore, we probably wouldn't even know about him. There he lived in an urban setting, a great ocean port where you could see the world coming in and out. He worked in maritime trades. He learned his literacy and he explored his literacy. He also lived in close proximity in Baltimore. In fact, he lived within, in many ways, a free black community. Uh, Baltimore, in the year he escaped of 1838, had about 3,000 slaves, but it had about 17,000 free blacks. It was a very robust community, lots of churches, uh, fraternal orders, uh, 
debating societies. He even got involved in a debating society. It's where he meets his first wife, Anna Murray. He got engaged with certain ministers and preachers who helped him find his voice. But what Frederick Bailey, which was his original name, locked on to as a kid were words and language. Now, we don't know entirely why that happened, except like every kid, uh, it's clear to me uh, from all the sources we have, including his autobiographies, that he found the one thing he was really good at, which is what most kids want to find. He found he was good with words and language, especially oratorical language, and he was already preaching informally uh, while he was still a slave by the age of 17 and 18, sometimes just outdoors in brush arbors with his so-called, he called what he called his band of brothers on Sunday afternoons. So how does this guy become Frederick Douglass? Well, by the time he escapes at age 20, Uh, through New York City and then to New Bedford, Massachusetts, one of the first things he did in New Bedford was to go down to the local AME church, this little black church, AME Zion Church. And within the first year he was there, they had him up front preaching. They found out Mm -hmm. this kid could preach. And that's where he began to hone uh, his homiletics. He learned how to preach to the text in the Protestant tradition. And within another year, he was uh, discovered preaching there uh, by some uh, uh, adherents of William Lloyd Garrison, the great abolitionist from Boston. They invited him out to Nantucket. Famously, he gives his first speech to white people. He's only 23 years old, and all of a sudden he was hired to go out on the abolition circuit. So words from the very beginning and actually throughout his life became Douglas's coin. Uh, they became the only real weapon he ever had, the only real power he ever had. He never had elective office. He never sought elective office. He got a little bit of power after the war to some degree as an advisor to presidents, as a kind of Republican Party insider. But the only power this man ever really had was this power of language. And that's in some ways his greatest legacy. If we're looking for somebody who basically led prophetically with language, uh, he's the prototype. Well, and it also it also hits home. I mean, this is this is an obvious point, but it's but the point um, kept coming back to me as I read the biography is is the the fear of literacy, the fear of language by by the slaver class, but the the fact that it was illegal to teach slaves uh, to read in many places, the fact that it had to be undertaken in underground, the incredible thirst and yearning among slaves for literacy. I mean, we see that in the wake of the the fall of the Confederacy when the Freedmen's Bureau is set up, just the every school is just, you know, oversubscribed and people of all ages huddling towards the schoolhouse to learn how to read. Douglas's story, I mean, one of the things you cannot help but wonder in, the, in is that Douglas is obviously a genius and singular, but how many Frederick Douglasses there were. It is it is sort of this kismet accident right, that because of the yeah. it could have been, right? Yeah. Like the because of the wife of the one's owner who was kind of sympathetic and taught him how to read and then he, you know, the situation, he ends up with a power of language that's denied to millions and he's just the one that we know. Yes, and it is, it is an age of language, let's remember. It's an age of oratory. Uh, it's an age of the uh, spoken, written, and published word. I mean, to Douglas, uh, like other abolitionists, the other, part, the, the other technology in his life that was so important was the rotary press, the printing press. And, of course, one of the first things he does when he comes back from England in 1847 is he tries to create his own newspaper which he will run for 16 years that newspaper you know today today with so many so many kinds of technologies which you know you and your business masters but that printing press and that newspaper was his voice and back to words again when he sat down in the winter of 1844-45 after three and a half years out on the circuit as this itinerant abolitionist orator, basically telling the stories of his youth, mostly, and also aiming directly at, a, at American secular and religious hypocrisy, as nobody else was, he publishes that first narrative, that first autobiography, it's only 115, 20 pages, and that he could take that book out now, as he did. He went off to England, Ireland, Scotland, Britain. He couldn't even keep it in print. 
It was so popular. He could hold that book in his hand and he could say, look, I was a slave and I'm black mm-hmm. and the world believes that black people don't have a history, don't, are not literate people, but look at me. I, here's my life. I wrote this. I am an equal human because I write. I am because I write. And I, I, you know, I've said this many times to public audiences when they ask me what, you know, what would Douglas believe was his most important this or that. And I usually end up saying in one way or another, he would probably pull a pen out of his pocket and he would say, I am a writer. Mm. And one, one thing people need to know, if they know about Douglas the orator, and they may have read a speech here or there, like the 4th of July speech, every major Douglas speech, and there are lots of them, exist in text. He wrote them down. He wasn't just a preacher who could walk into a hall and blow out the lights, although he could do that too, if, if you wanted him to. But he wrote these things down in 25-page texts, Then he would take it out on the road, and of course he'd riff on and off it. But he was a writer, and that took time. You know, he came out of slavery in order, writing is harder. It took him time to master writing, and he had some help with that. One one thing that you can't help but but think about when you read the book is um, the technologies of communication and persuasion at the time. You just sort of named two of them, and I think we can talk about them a bit. So one is the abolition circuit, right? So to go back to think about a social movement that is advancing this cause— it's it's a just cause, but in some ways radical. Um, certainly, you know, I mean, it's not like I mean, it's one of these like, oh, sure, everyone was an abolitionist. No, not really. It was a, uh, a small was percentage, a very even, even yeah. of upstate New York. <laughs> yes, very right. So you've got this this small, basically small radical fringe movement um, attempting to seize the consciousness of the nation, yeah. and of course, there's no broadcast, there's no TV, there's no internet, all that things. The sir speaking circuit's a huge part of how you do that at the time. Describe what that is. I mean, Doug, this is how Douglas first enters public life as a person who goes around to say, listen to me tell you about the depredations of slavery. Well, it, in his early years, 1840s, the way the abolitionist circuit worked is they would send out troops, groups of speakers. They would usually be three, four or five of them at a time. They would hold anti-slavery meetings and sometimes outdoors, sometimes in churches, sometimes in city halls, wherever they could get a venue, and they weren't always welcome. Uh, but then they would, they would have resolutions to speak to, and the speakers would speak to or against it and so on. Um, but one of their purposes, especially these, these Garrisonians, the followers of William Lloyd Garrison, was to stimulate a response in their audience, to anger their audience, to rile up their audience, And indeed, if the audience ended up throwing a few things at him, that was a success. Hmm. But what happened early on, those first three years he's out on the circuit, Douglas was so adept at mimicry and so adept at making the case, especially against religious hypocrisy. And these are all well-churched people, well-churched towns. They're often speaking in, you know, Protestant pulpits. He, he gave this, this speech over and over and over again that became known as the slaveholder's sermon. And uh, what it was, Douglas would sometimes go into a, a, a performance. He was a performer, to say the least. And he's only in his 20s, let's remember. He was this dashing, handsome, you know, tall, you know, kid right out of slavery, so it seemed, until until he started to talk. But he would go and he would mimic a, a, a pro-slavery preacher. Slaves, be loyal to your masters. And he'd quote that stuff out of the Bible. And he'd entertain people. And they'd laugh and they'd cry. And there were times, and I have a couple examples of this in the book, where the, the abolitionist speakers would be speaking to this resolution or that resolution, and somebody in the audience would shout out, Hey, Fred, do the sermon. And he'd he'd break into the sermon. So he learned early on the performative nature of this kind of oratory. And then later, he does the same thing with all kinds of political issues, all kinds of, you know, the the politics of slavery, whether that was about the Fugitive Slave Act or the Kansas-Nebraska Act or Fugitive Slave Rescues, Bleeding Kansas and on down the line. He, he, He understood, as any major orator of that time had to, that this was about public persuasion, it was about performance, and he had learned early on 
that you had to reach the moral heart of your audience and then hope that you could reach their political behavior. And he happened to be very good at it. Um, in fact, he was so good at it that by the 1850s, it became, again, I say this in the book, it became a kind of, and even after the war, even more so, it became a kind of an American thing to see Douglas, to go hear Douglas. And I have many examples that I didn't even use in the book, especially later in his life, of people reflecting in newspapers about the first time they heard Douglas, the first time they saw Douglas. It was like seeing Niagara Falls. I saw yes, Douglas. It's, <laughs> it's funny because I, it reminded me when I took a Russian literature class uh, of Tolstoy, oh, yeah. uh, who, who I did not realize until I took this class was was a was a legend, was a famous yeah. sort of celebrity in his time that right. like people and a great talked about. A great that's storyteller. That's right. And a great storyteller. And people yeah. talked about it and they wanted like, And so I didn't I didn't quite realize the level of it or Dickens is the same thing. I mean, Dickens, yeah. people go see Dickens, right? People knew who Dickens was like the degree to which he was a legend in his time and, and his fame and the word of mouth about what it meant to watch this, this man perform. Um, and, and so he does this oratory and then he, and then he, he writes the book, um, and he goes. He goes to talk about the European tour because it's fascinating to me his reception there, right. and and that is a kind of turning point in his life. Well, it is. He's twenty seven. He's just published the narrative. It's the summer of eighteen forty five. Uh, he plans this visit to the British Isles under the sponsorship of the of Garrison's operation in Boston. It isn't clear how long he had intended to stay, but he ends up staying about nineteen months. A month, one month in Ireland, several months in Scotland, and then most of the rest of it between Britain and Scotland. Uh, they fell in love with him, they, especially the reform world of Ireland, Scotland, and Britain. By then, of course, uh, Britain had freed its slaves throughout its empire, uh, and, you know, with, with mixed results uh, and so on. And nevertheless, Britain saw itself as an anti slavery nation. And here was this young, African-American, brilliant speaker. He took the place by storm. Uh, they loved him in Ireland. In fact, to this day, <laughs> you'd think he was a, a born patron saint of Ireland or something. He only spent f one, one month in Ireland, and there are at least right. two monuments of him, at least two or three murals. Um, Scotland was perfect because he arrived in the midst of a classic Scottish ecumenical war. They were having this huge battle over money that had been raised among American slaveholders. And there was this crusade going on called send back the money. Well, this, this Douglas's favorite subject, religious hypocrisy, he hit the ground running. They loved him. They wrote songs about him. They wrote poems about him. He would walk into a small town in upper Scotland and there'd be a little children's choir singing a song about him. I mean, and it's uh, Douglas is twenty seven. He's twenty eight. He's overwhelmed by this. Yeah, it, it make, makes an enormous impression. I mean, he is blown yeah. away too. And he'd never experienced a place that, well, he experienced some racism in the British Isles, but nothing like in the U.S. He was warmly accepted. He was admired. Uh, it almost overwhelmed him. Uh, and then in Britain, he meets all the famous reformers, uh, politicians, and and he makes a lot of a lot of lifetime British friends a group of whom raised the money to purchase his freedom from the Auld Brothers back in Maryland. And he returns to the U.S., but not until he had those free papers in his hand. He, he was formally and legally free once he returned to America. Right. And we should, of course, recall for people that don't remember their history, um, this is amidst the great battles over the domain of slavery in the nation in the run up to the Civil War. The Fugitive Slave Act, of course, the sort of most famous legislative blow to right. essentially um, allow for uh, for the federal government to essentially um, bless the operations of of slave catchers of kidnappers uh, in the in the free states. Uh, this is this is one of you know you said uh, the Kansas Nebraska Act and Bleeding Kansas. It's it's one of a sort of series of pitched right. um, conflicts and battles that lead up to the Civil War. So this is this is a man who's a freed slave in the North at a time when that that didn't mean a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And he returns in 1847 in the midst of the Mexican War. 
you know, there's this war of westward expansion and slavery expansion that has just exploded. And by the way, he, he and I, you've read the book, so you know this, but when he returned there in 47, he was a very angry young black man because he had just been treated like a, mostly like a conquering hero for the last 19 months. And he knows he's returning to the hothouse of American racism, right. pro-slavery America. And he is so angry. He comes back and a primary line in all of his speeches, the first months he's back is my country hates me and I hate it back. I have no country. I have no patriotism. And on and on he would go just brutally chastising the country. And one time, Wendell Phillips, famous abolitionist, took him aside, and he says, Fred, uh, tone it down, man. I mean, you, you, you're going to lose the audience here. No. But, but he didn't tone it down. Uh, and and it, was, it was a Douglas now who was feeling much more independent with his voice, with his life. The trouble was, how do you make a living at this? You know, uh, as I've always said to my students, being an abolitionist was not not a good career move. It just, you know, it's not. There's nothing upwardly mobile about it. <laughs> right. He right. goes out to Rochester, creates a newspaper, has five children by 1849, and is trying to make ends meet. And the only way he could make a dime now was with his pen and his voice. And and for the for the next. 30-some years until 1877, when Rutherford Hayes appointed him uh, to his first federal appointment, he never made any money except with his voice and his pen. Uh, you know, there are people today making a living with their voice and their pen, but that's never been easy. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit, when you talk about his anger there, that's obviously that's, there's sort of a, like an emo, that's an emotional characterization of a state of mind, but it relates to the, 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 the evolving p political, I think it's fair to say kind of political theology of, of Frederick Gulag. This was a very, you know, comes up through a very churched universe. He, he, oh, he, yeah. he encounters the written world, you know, through, through homiletics. It's a very and, biblical and, world views. Yeah. yeah. And, and that it, it, for the people that know the sort of famous speeches of his, you know, what to the slave is 4th of July and uh, the one that he gives at the, at the Freedmen's monument uh, in, in Washington. Um, he, what's so fascinating is he de begins to develop political theory that is, at once kind of radical and liberal it's it, 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 right, it's right. it is in a in a fascinating space in that it is it is full of appropriately righteous fury oh, yeah. at the nation and its utter evil and hypocrisy yes but finds something to redeem in it ultimately as a project he does and you hit it right on the head he he is at times a genuine radical who flirts with, by the 1850s, uses of violence. Uh, he is willing to use almost any strategy available. He can speak revolution with almost anyone. However, he's also an evolving political liberal in that he wants to believe, he actually does believe and wants to believe, even, the, even in the bleakest of moments, that Solutions can be found through politics, uh, through the vote, if, if black folk could ever get the vote. Uh, he much prefers somehow changing the country through law, through politics, if it's possible. But, of course, the 1850s is a decade, an extremely important decade in American history, when that kind of faith is put to the ultimate test. How do you keep faith in ultimate future freedom for black people? After the Kansas-Nebraska Act, right. after especially the Dred Scott decision. On the day after the Dred Scott decision, which said black people had no rights, which white people or the nation would ever need to adhere to, all black people lived in the land of the Dred Scott case right. and not in the land of anything else. But what Douglas had faith in, and you can't underestimate this, is the natural rights tradition. And by that, I mean basically the creeds, the first principles of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. To Douglas, the Declaration of Independence wasn't Jefferson's. I mean, he gave Jefferson credit for writing it. But, but the principles of the Declaration of Independence to Douglas, as he once put it, were like precious ore. They came from the earth, or they came from God, or they came from nature. They were nature's laws. You know, you're, you're born with certain inalienable liberties that no one can take away from you. 
Now, he had both that kind of secular faith that would sustain him usually, but he also drew upon this apocalyptic, millennialist, biblical view of history. Whatever we think of it today, it was a different thing in the 19th century. It was this belief that somehow God had his hands in history. God was going to choose moments to enter history. In the 19th century, they always called it divine providence, would somehow find moments. And some of those moments would be horrific. They would, the whole societies might get overturned, as in the, as in the Old Testament. And Douglas drew especially from his deep, deep reading of the Hebrew prophets. His favorite prophet was Isaiah, but so was Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, and the great one. He also drew off Genesis many times. The, the Old Testament and the Hebrew prophets were the source of Douglas's storytelling. When he needed, in a crisis, in a terrible catastrophic moment, whether that was Fugitive Slave Act, Dred Scott case, secession, you know, uh, the, the terrible civil rights case of 1883, which obliterates the 14th Amendment, he would, he would fall back on this ancient kind of wisdom, this ancient kind of faith. Now, that wasn't always easy to do, and a lot of his followers sometimes said, oh, come on, Fred, you've been, you've been preaching that line for decades. What do we have faith in now? And then when the lynching crisis comes in the 1890s, where do we find faith now? And he even found, at the end of his famous speech on lynching, he found another way to put his hope in natural rights. Now, without these two deep old traditions, there's no way he could have sustained faith in America. He probably would have had to emigrate like some other people chose to. He also had one other thing that sustained him, and it brings us back to where we were before. He could write. He he could... He could vent all of this. He could, he could express it with his voice and his pen. And, and, and you understand that. I mean, how many times in your own work do, are, you, are you, you know, you're, you're struggling, you're angry, you're, right. you're frustrated, but you sit down. You have the outlet. You have the outlet. You process it in words. You put it into a paragraph. And this I learned about Douglas over and over and over. In a crisis, whatever it was, he would go to his desk, sit down, write it up, and figure out what he thought about it. And that almost always became a speech. And he'd take it out on the road. If he didn't have that power, who knows? Where does he turn? Yeah, how do you sustain it? And and I think that, you know, we should say that the <laughs> sort of Old Testament ideas of divine providence and sort of, you know, millennial expectations of cataclysm are yeah. are not crazy in the 18 in the years between say 1852 and 1865 because the country is you know it's literally coming yeah. apart it is coming apart before everyone's eyes everyone sees that happening both sides in that war basically interpreted it from that same position <laughs> right it's always a struggle figuring out the difference between what he actually believes religiously that's never as easy easily discerned and how he's using Biblical rhetoric and biblical storytelling and worldviews, those are not always the same thing. Yeah, and that's it comes through in the book. I mean, it's just clearly that this is it's the vocabulary he speaks. It's the it's the it's the universe of references that his audience has. And he, so it, it's just the it's the the lingua franca of the time uh, uh, is that. And, and, is. and the degree to which Lincoln he's. Uses it. Yeah, Lincoln, Lincoln used it all the time. All the yeah. time. And and mm. the entire abolition movement. I mean the abolitionist sure. movement is a movement born of that. It's it, it 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 doesn't there's you know way of conceiving of it independent of its its spiritual dimension. Um but again, it's hard to express I think how for someone like Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists white and black but obviously more black abolitionists whose bodies are on the line in a way that no white person's ever is. The the lead up to the Civil War is a succession of setbacks. I mean, it's oh, yeah. they keep losing. They keep losing in the run up. So, right. you ha you know, between, you know, Kansas, and Nebraska and Dred Scott. I mean, it's not like they're they're not winning the, the, the case of a full liberty, abolition and, and free and equal representation. No, in fact, uh, you could argue that uh, the most despairing little period in this whole epoch 
is the three years between Dred Scott and the secession crisis. Right. Uh, there were there were movements then of, of led by blacks to emigrate from the country. Martin Delaney led one of them. Henry Harlan Garnett led another one. Douglas always argued against that, but he actually came close. He actually, on the brink of, of the war, had booked tickets hmm. for he and his daughter. His oldest uh, child was Rosetta, who was by then, I think, 22. They were going to go visit Haiti and see what it looked like. There was a Haitian immigration scheme going on. And he had booked the ticket uh, about eight days or so after Fort Sumter. And Fort Sumter happened, and then there's this little column in his newspaper that says, trip to Haiti canceled, <laughs> because, you know, the events were, were happening. Now, th- th- this is another thing about Douglas. He really learned, as, as any, you know, rhetorician has to, if, if your only weapon is your voice and your pen, you got to learn to exploit crises. you got to learn to use the moment when you have one, like we're living in now. How many times have you heard this or yes. even said it? We're having a reckoning. We got to make the best of it. We got to, we got to, you know, exploit it and so on. That is exactly what he did with secession. It is exactly what he did with the outbreak of the war. But it was the result, as you just suggested, of years of pent up agony, pent up despair. And what he became overnight, and I have a whole chapter on this, what he became overnight when the war broke out is a virulent war propagandist. Uh, he created some of the nastiest, <laughs> violent war propaganda in language you'll ever want to read. He created slaveholders into the horrible Hun, and they must be destroyed. And I think that reflected in Douglas, and I say this at length, that reflected in Douglas a rage, an old yeah. rage in him that goes back to 20 years as a slave and the and the hundreds of years of slavery for the rest of his people. Now there was a sanctioned war against that system. Right. And he wasn't going to let this opportunity pass by if he could help it. So I want to ask you about uh, one of the most interesting relationships in all of American history, the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass right after this. It is through this period. I mean, this is the time when the Republican Party is founded, obviously, um, in, you know, mm-hmm. right around uh, with, with with Lincoln's election and then the secession crisis uh, soon thereafter, his assumption. Mm-hmm. And then um, what what is the relationship? Talk about the, the beginnings of the relationship to the extent there is one between Douglas and Lincoln, because that is a, one of the most fascinating yeah. relationships in American history. It is. It becomes one. Um, Douglas first is aware of Lincoln only in about 1858. He became aware of Lincoln because of the Lincoln-Douglas, Stephen Douglas debates out in Illinois for the U.S. Senate. In fact, Douglas was actually in Illinois during at least a couple of those debates. I couldn't determine whether he actually attended one. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, but, but he was there. He followed it in the press. He was entirely aware of, of, the, of the substance of those great debates and that the, these two guys were debating the future of slavery. Uh, then in the 1860 election, Douglas still didn't know quite what to do with Lincoln. He viewed Lincoln as essentially what Lincoln was at that point, certainly on the surface, which was this old Henry Clay Whig who had become a re- moderate Republican, but who was anti-slavery. In fact, he admired, he said in 1860, Lincoln's anti-slavery tendencies. Tendencies. Well, to a radical abolitionist, tendencies was still yeah. wasn't enough. So he wasn't sure. He actually, I'm not even sure that he voted for Lincoln in 1860, because there was still this thing, this tiny little far out party in New York called the Radical Abolition Party. And I think he may have thrown his vote away uh, in that election. I know he did in 1858. But at any rate, once the war was on, Douglas tried to own up, to shoulder up, to Lincoln and the Republicans, but of course in the first year, year and a half of the war, the Lincoln administration is not making this war a a battle against slavery. Uh, They're trying to contain it, trying to keep it a limited war. Fugitive slaves are being returned, or so they tried. And Douglas, for that first year of the war, became a ferocious critic of Lincoln. They're also, the North is also getting its ass kicked a bunch. I mean, the the war's not going well. There's no, yeah. There's no clear uh, outcome of any kind yet, much less an anti-slavery outcome. His tune on Lincoln will change. 
finally, with the preliminary proclama proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1862, and then decidedly changes with the final proclamation uh, in January 1863. But that's a torturous process, an absolutely torturous process of finding out how, what to believe in and how. And also to whether what, what can be trusted here. I mean, if you go back to Lincoln, Douglas, or Bates, and Lincoln spends a ton of time you know, assuring his yeah. white audience, that just because he doesn't believe in slavery, he doesn't like black people. You know, he doesn't think they're yeah, equal. No, he... I mean, he's, he's, you know, there's tremendous pains being taken at every step along the way to assure moderate white pro unionists or people who that like, yeah. don't worry, we don't believe in equality. We're not one of those crazy people. And of course, Douglas and the rest of free black society and enslaved mm -hmm. blacks who who hear this or, you know, they yeah. they hear this. <laughs> they know what, you know. Well, it's classic wedge politics. Stephen Douglas portrays Lincoln as this, you know, inward loving right. radical, you know, Jacobin. Uh, you know, if you elect him, he'll have every, he'll have blacks and whites all right. intermarrying each other. In fact, in the Lincoln Douglas debates, Stephen Douglas used Frederick Douglass's name. He he made up this crazy story that Abraham Lincoln had been seen riding in a cage with Fred Douglas. And of course that wasn't true. Wow. But that's how famous Douglas already was that he would be used, you know, it was like they used to do with Nancy Pelosi yes, and Ted exactly, Kennedy, right, yeah. you know, the Republicans. Oh, it's just yeah. another Ted Kennedy or something, you know, uh, or, or worse. Um, but it is about who you can trust. And, it, and the other key thing here is, say, in the middle of the secession crisis, for example, and then right on through up into 1863, Douglas is not an insider in the Republican Party. He does not know them yet. He's going to know him later, but he doesn't know these people. He's not inside the circles of this. He doesn't know some of the machinations going on in 1862. But he doesn't know that Lincoln's been over at the War Department crafting this proclamation. Nobody knew, uh, frankly. But Douglas is not an insider. So he's, he's, he's sitting there in Rochester, New York, reading new, every newspaper he can get and then weighing in himself in his uh, monthly newspaper and trying, and then going out on the road constantly to speak, and trying to have a voice in this terrible crisis that is existential. Existential for the country, for his family, for his people, for everything that he knows. And then after Emancipation Proclamation, it's existential, especially for his sons, because he recruits two of them into the army. That's right, and 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 that is a good point to 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 emphasize something, and I just want to make sure that we emphasize in this conversation, which is that, you know, Frederick Douglass is a obviously, as we said in the beginning, he's a he's a genius, he's a he's a sort of one in a million talent, but the, you know, the story of black resistance to slavery, the story of of black abolition, as 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 a story of self determination, as opposed to the Garrisonian tradition of you know, noblesse oblige or, 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 or spiritual yeah. emancipation for these other people who are, you know, that you take pity on is, is a story that I think has been obscured for very long, but has moved in the scholarship towards a more central place, which is to say black Americans, Frederick Douglass, perhaps most famously among them, but by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands take their sovereign rights into their own hands in the way they act in the war, in their enlisting, in their agitation, in their meetings, in their AME church. Douglas is part of a broader movement of black liberation and self-determination. He surely was, although it is true that the American abolition movement was biracial. Uh, uh, Douglas actually learned a great deal from Garrison and the Garrisonians, both in technique and strategy and a lot of other things. And he had tremendous respect for many of his fellow white abolitionists. He also had terrible rivalries yes. and breakups with some of them, too. Oh, God, the factional fights are insane. They're, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like the old argument, there's no fight like a fight between two Marxists. Well, there's no fight like a fight between right, right. two <laughs> radical reformers. You know, they're always going to disagree. And then after the war, he has terrible rivalries with the next generation of black leaders. And that sometimes is really just personal. They want to knock him off. Uh, anyway, but yeah, it, it's a, uh, it, but you know, abolition, it, abolition is the prototypical American reform movement, a radical reform movement. Everything that's happened since and women's rights, uh, you name it, you know, right down, down the line, the labor movement and on and on and on have always been modeling this antebellum movement against a system 
and an institution that, frankly, almost nobody thought right. they'd ever live to see ended. The, 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 the great fact in the middle of all that, of course, is that it took this massive war and 700,000 lives to actually end it. Um, and Douglas had so much to say about that, too, brilliantly, about what it meant that slavery had only ended in this country through tremendous violence. What is his reaction to Lincoln's death? Well, it's amazing, actually. It's fascinating. Uh, you know, by that time, by the spring of 65, uh, he had come to know Lincoln from meeting him three times, um, twice at the White House in the Oval Office, two really fascinating, pivotal meetings, especially the second one in August of 1864, where Lincoln actually invited Douglas to the White House, solicited his advice, his help, and so on, when Lincoln believed he was not going to be reelected that fall. Uh, the last one being at the second, right after the second inaugural in the East Room of the White House. Uh, so by then, Lincoln and Douglas, although they started out at very different places, had actually come almost to speak from the same script. If you read the second inaugural, maybe the greatest speech by an American president, certainly one of the shortest, but if you read the second inaugural, it's essentially the use of that same apocalyptic language. And it, and it promises that every drop of blood shed by the lash shall be paid by blood shed by the sword. Now, I'm convinced... And Douglas was in the audience that day. He was right down to Lincoln's left, about 11 or 12 rows out. He was right there. He heard it. And I'm convinced, and I mean, I can't prove it, but I'm convinced that Douglas had wished he could have written that speech for, for Lincoln. However, that Lincoln wrote it, made it all the more important. So when Lincoln is killed, especially given the moment, you know, the, the war has just ended, the surrender has just happened at Appomattox four days before, uh, the death of Lincoln and the portents now of possible continued fighting and division uh, was terrifying. And Douglas was on the road giving a speech, as always. He hurried back to Rochester, and uh, there was a huge gathering of people, as there were in towns all over the country when they got the news of Lincoln's death. And Douglas was in the audience. They called on him. They yelled out, Douglas, come speak. And he went up, and it's not clear he had any notes for this, but we do have a, a text written down later. He got up and made this deeply moving short speech to his f neighbors, really, his fellow Rochesterites, saying that he had never felt such a, quote, kinship with his countrymen as he did that night. Kinship. It's an interesting word that somehow in Lincoln's death at the end of this war, and the prospects now for black freedom made him feel like kinfolk with his countrymen. Um, what he does with Lincoln the rest of his life for the next 30 years is fascinating because he basically invented about three different kinds of Lincolns, depending on the audience, right. <laughs> which is what everybody does with Lincoln. You want, Link you want Lincoln to be this? You, you create that Lincoln. You want Lincoln to, to support that? You create that Lincoln. And, and, and Douglas was extremely adept at doing that, depending on what the audience the, was. The, the death of Lincoln leads to, to Johnson's disastrous uh, uh, reign, his, his impeachment, and then, and then uh, 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 the horrible white supremacist terrorism and violence in the South under uh, presidential reconstruction, yeah. which is then supplanted uh, by congressional reconstruction and the form the sort of vanguard of radical Republicans grants presidency and, uh, and, and, and military occupation of the South and an attempt at the real first attempt and which in some ways has never been rivaled since of genuine full and equal multiracial democracy. And it's, and, and talk a little bit about Douglas's role in the Republican Party increasingly and in Reconstruction as a project and his theorizing of what this new version of American democracy looks like? Well, uh, great question. Uh, huge story, but a great question. I'd go and I'll go right to the core of his most hopeful moment. In many ways, his most sanguine moment. It's 1868 and 80, 1868 and 69. He wrote a speech called The Composite Nation, uh, and the text we have of it comes from 1869. He gave it 
a number of times. But this speech, this amazing speech, is Douglas at the high point. This is the moment when Reconstruction has succeeded. 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment's been passed and ratified. The 15th Amendment has just been passed. It's not quite ratified, but soon to be. You know, the radical Republican regimes are, are all being put in place in the South. And even by 69, uh, you know, Grant administration is about to move against the Ku Klux Klan, all those been ter- terrible terror and violence practiced in 68. But at this point, Douglas becomes such a proponent of this new America, the new America invented out of the, the Civil War and the Second Constitution, the Second Republic. Hmm. It's almost like he feels himself a founder of the Second Republic. And in this speech of composite nation, he does many things. But one of the arguments he makes is that the United States ought to now export its ideology. It, he becomes a kind of a soft imperialist. He, he says, you know, we should be exporting this, this new equality uh, to the Caribbean, to Latin America, to other places in the world overnight. And he wasn't alone in that. A lot of other abolitionists began to think that, too. America now has has... A chance, he says in that speech, to do something no people have ever done, to create a nation that is multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious, all living with equality before law. And then in the middle of the speech, he makes this robust case for Chinese immigration, which is just then becoming a big issue out in the West. The first Chinese Exclusion Act doesn't come till 1874, but it's already brewing. The huge Chinese Exclusion Act will come later in 1882, I think. But in the middle of the speech, he makes this amazing case <laughs> for this multicultural America, that this, this, this level of pluralism no people have ever attempted. And he says, look, Americans, get ready. They're coming. And Chinese civilization is 3,000 years old. Yes, they speak a strange language. Yes, they have strange religions. But they will assimilate. He has a model. His theory is classic assimilationism. He says, look, like all these other peoples who've come here, including black people, they will assimilate to our creeds. They, they will bring their genius. They will bring their knowledge of science. They will bring all the... It's, it, and if you read that speech today, I swear, it sounds like either a multiculturalism manifesto of the 1990s, or it sounds like, you know, a diversity statement of universities today, uh, and and better. You know, that speech could be given right now, you know, to some entering freshman class uh, at a university, and it would sound like it had just been written. So at that moment, he has this tremendous hope. But, Chris, here's the thing. After 1870, I can't find any example of him giving it anywhere because of what happens to Reconstruction. He puts it away. And by the time, obviously by the time he um, is in the end of his life, he's watching the end of this project. The, the, the you know, the, essentially yeah. lynching, yeah. Klan terrorism, uh, and uh, the reinstitution of white supremacy and apartheid in the South, the totalitarian system of racial oppression. Um, but the, but the, the vision he has, I mean, I, I kind of want to end here because that note of the thing, the reason people should read the book or, or spend some time even reading Douglas's writing is because he is to me the most potent prophetic theorist of true American pluralism in a timeless fashion that that is still an articulation of the project that we're all working towards so fitfully and haltingly and with such great difficulty in the year 2020 and with Donald Trump as president, but, but it's there, the ingredients are there, the vision for there, the vision for what it would, would mean for all of us to actually be full and equal citizens, no matter what color of our skin, no matter who we worship, no matter who we are in our identity in many other ways, even ways that he couldn't have conceived of at the time, the theoretical structure for that vision of America is there in Douglas back then. It is, and it goes through, obviously, uh, its its great ups and its great downs. It came from, in him, an experience that made him at times both love and hate his country. He loved the creeds, said it a thousand times. Uh, equality, the popular sovereignty, a republican form of government, the right of revolution, etc. 
Uh, he, some have argued he made even too much of a case for the power of the vote at the expense of economic rights, and there's some truth to that. Douglas was a much better political thinker than he was an economic thinker. Um, but he comes from a place of great defeat at times, but also great victory at other times. And, and we so often use this term, pluralism, don't we? Uh, just loosely, or, uh, you know, multiculturalism. Uh, we use this so loosely that we don't even know what it means anymore. Well, Douglas knew what it meant. It, it meant the dream put into reality that people of every kind of creed, every kind of race, background, ethnicity, difference, even though they're going to fight it out, <laughs> they're going to fight like hell over resources and and meaning and religion and interpretation. They're going to fight like hell. But it's possible to create a democracy in which all of them can actually live. And yeah, he never completely gave up on that. And, and, I, and even in the face of lynching, that last great speech of his life called Lessons of the Hour, it's amazing. He's an old man of 75 with trembling hands, but he goes out on the road Dozens of times in 1894, 76 by then, giving this speech, which is really an analysis, a really analytical treatment of why lynching was happening. And yet still, at the end of that, he says, you know, you can kill us, you can lynch people, but you cannot kill these, these elements of natural law. They will be sustained. They will live through it. Now, I'm not just saying that because, you know, you go to Douglas for some hope, because that's not what you'll always find. Uh, but, it, but he is an example of a prophetic voice uh, who never gave up on this idea. And think about the monument stuff now, just to end on that, where you began. Good Lord, how are we going to replace this memorial landscape? You know, we, 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 I have a piece actually coming out tomorrow in the New York Times with some recommendations about this. Um, you know, if the Confederate landscape is coming down, and uh, it appears most of it is, and Christopher Columbus, and so on and so on, we don't know how far this is going to go. But how do we harness this energy now? What kind of new memorial landscape might this country imagine uh, out of our pluralism? It's an amazing opportunity, if you think about it, for artists and curators and historians and creative people. And I think the Biden campaign should get behind it instead of leading from the back. I think they should take hold of this and try to help Americans imagine how to create a new memorial landscape, not just about heroes, but maybe about ideas. David Blight is a Sterling Professor of American History and Director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. The book we were just discussing, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. It's an incredible piece of work, and I really, really recommend you pick it up. And David, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you, Chris. Once again, my great thanks to David Blight. You really should pick up that book. And if you don't pick that up, just, just Google some Frederick Douglass speeches. Just Google, literally put that search term in. It's worth it. <laughs> uh, they're, they're remarkable texts. We love to hear from you. Tweet us at the hashtag withpod, email withpod at gmail.com. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team and Kate Shaw, and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening.